You'll need a Bible tonight. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 10. Sorry, Matthew chapter 9. But we'll pray first. Father, we thank you for your word that you've declared through prophets and apostles and especially through your Son. We ask that tonight you'll help us to understand a little bit better of what you've told us and encourage us, we pray, tonight in our praying. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now this is a, a talk about praying. Praying for, I originally call this praying for evangelists, but evangelists in the New Testament seems to be a kind of a technical word with a restricted meaning. Uh, so tonight I want to talk to people who are people who tell the gospel. So I'm talking to all, anyone who's a Christian. Disciple makers, people who share the gospel. And this is not about how to do it, but how to pray. This is about praying for the sharing of the gospel. Now in Luke chapter, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, we're told Jesus is going through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now we're going to look at another passage tonight that will remind us of serious threat, hostility. And we live in a world where there is great hostility and threat in other parts of the world, but even for our world, the, the, the part we're in, there is certainly hostility. Uh, there is uh, difficulties in being a Christian because people speak against us, they don't like us, they are um, prejudiced against us and against the gospel. And it's easy to take note of the hostility and feel that this is a really bad thing and the evil ones behind it all and all of that no doubt is true. But Jesus here sees people as like sheep without a shepherd, harassed. And it seems to me that as you look at the context in which we live, that's not a bad way to see it. You may feel threatened, but you could also see people harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus, when he saw them, had compassion on them. Now, this is not the only occasion when we're told this. On another occasion, when he saw them, a huge crowd that had followed him around the lake, if you remember, he saw them as harassed and helpless, and what he did was he fed them. That is, he taught, he taught them for a long time, and then when it got too late, he got his disciples to go and get some food. And that was the feeding of the 5,000. Remember that? Here, the compassion for the harassed and helpless sheep is an instruction to the disciples to pray to the Lord of the harvest, because what he sees out there, all these harassed and helpless sheep, is actually a harvest. He's mixing his metaphors, but send out the Lord, get the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And uh, a long time ago, one of the early versions of the Good News Bible said, send out more workers into his harvest. Uh, but that was not right. Uh, it just says, send out workers. And I've always wondered, well, where were the workers? And I think that they're sitting under the gum tree having a smoko, and this is a prayer that they might be sent out. Okay? Well, here's the starting point for praying for people to tell the gospel that the Lord of the harvest will send them out. Okay? The Lord of the harvest has to send them out. Now, churches can try to do it. Preachers can try to do it. Come on, you lot, get out and do it. But it would be much better if the Lord of the harvest did. <laughs> and that's what we want to pray. This is about praying. Now look at Ephesians 6. I hope that we won't go all night tonight. So this is kind of just digging into a couple of little sample places where someone is actually telling the gospel. Here is the great apostle, St. Paul. Ephesians 6, we read it earlier. It's interesting to think of St. Paul wanting people to pray for him. What does he want them to pray? Well, verse 18, he wants them to pray for all the Lord's people, but in verse 19, Ephesians 6, 
Pray for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so I will speak fearlessly. I'll, I'll fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Now notice a couple of things here. He wants words to be given to him. Uh, do you think that Paul ever lacked words? <laughs> Well, it's important because those of us who talk a lot, we don't lack words, but we want the Lord to give us the words. Uh, Jesus said something like this in Mark 13. Remember, he says, when you get arrested and I bring you up before the council and stuff, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you what to say. And I think Paul is saying that. Now, it's not as though Paul doesn't know the gospel. It's not as though he doesn't know what to say, but he's still trusting the Lord will give him the words on the day. That's worth praying for, isn't it? Especially if you are a talker, or if you think you know a lot, <laughs> or in both cases. Now he wants, he wants them to pray that he will make the mystery of the gospel known fearlessly. Well, the mystery of the gospel is explained a few times in Ephesians, Colossians, other places. One version of it is that the, the secret of the gospel, which was hidden before and now has been revealed with the coming of Christ, is that Christ is among you Gentiles. The gospel is now for everybody. Or in the terms of Ephesians, you can see it in the earlier chapters, that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together, members of the same body, and uh, participants together with Israel in the promises of Christ. Uh, that whatever was promised to, in the Old Testament to Israel now is applied to everybody. That's the wonderful heart of the gospel for all of the nations. Well, he wants to know, he wants to make it known fearlessly as this version, this is verse 19, and he says it again again in verse 20. He's in, he's in prison, but he wants to be able to declare it fearlessly as he should. Now, does all the versions say fearlessly? Boldly is another version. Um, it's kind of got the idea of speaking it plainly, uh, openly, publicly, and not merely mouthed. Uh, some versions say boldly, and uh, so boldly and fearlessly, can, you can kind of have a John Wayne, um, Clint Eastwood kind of thing behind this. It's not that. It's someone just saying really plainly, clearly, without any fear that you're going to get punched in the head because you've said it. See, the gospel is, is clear and plain, and it should be said like that. That's what he's praying for. But that's good for all of us who are simple, plain people. What? He wants the gospel expressed in plain, clear language so you cannot misunderstand it. All right. Now the other passage is in, a, is in Acts chapter 4, which has got similar language in it. Now, we read some of this before as well. Now this is in the context of threats. So... A lame man has been healed. Peter has addressed the crowd. A large collection of people has come. They've been arrested. They've been taken before the Sanhedrin, which is the same crowd that had Jesus executed. So quite a dangerous body. They've been warned off. Don't talk about any of this anymore. This is chapter 4, um, verse uh, 19 onwards. Verse, eight, verse 17, he warned, they warned them not to speak any longer to anyone in this name of Jesus. Well, they said, well, you've got to work out whether we'll follow you or God, but we're going to do what we were told. Anyway, they come back and they have this prayer time. Verse 23, Acts 4, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. I'm going to comment on this raising their voices together uh, in a little while. But here, the whole group of them gets together and calls out to God in the face of the threats and they address the sovereign creator Lord who made the earth and the sea and everything that's in it, including the rulers. And they quote this bit from the Old Testament about the Holy Spirit spoke through David about why the nations are plotting. Because Herod and Pilate and all the Gentiles, they've conspired together against your holy servant Jesus. But they actually only did what you'd planned to do anyway. 
In other words, they're, they're appealing to the Lord who rules the nations, the Creator Lord who rules the nations. So in the face of hostility, and you think that you're you know, becoming less and less powerful, and poor old Christendom is sinking and shrinking, and we don't have all the influence we had before, well, talk to the one with influence. Talk to the Lord of the nations, the Lord of the creation. That's what they're doing. And what do they pray? Well, verse 29, consider their threats. Now, when the Lord in the Psalm 2, is it Psalm 2? When the Lord considered their threats, what did the Lord do? He laughed. That's right. He held them in derision, is the old version. That's worth remembering that, isn't it? You can get things out of proportion, really. Get them in proportion. Talk to the Lord who owns the whole world. But what they're praying is that the Lord will enable his servants to speak the word with boldness or fearlessness. It's the same word as in Ephesians. Like they'd already done. That's what got him into trouble, actually. So, chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, after they all, the huge crowd gathers after the man has been healed. There's this crowd gathers, and then Peter tells them all the stuff. And then uh, when they get hauled up before the Sanhedrin, chapter 4, verse 8, it's the same. This is, this is speaking plainly. This is what speaking fearlessly means, what speaking boldly means. So chapter 3, verse 12, and chapter 4, verse 8, I think are examples of what fearless means. Plain speaking, expressing the gospel in plain terms so people cannot misunderstand it. Well, they didn't misunderstand it. Um, they didn't like it, but they certainly understood it. So enable your servants to speak the word with boldness, which is what they were told to do at the beginning. That's just the commission, isn't it? Make the gospel plain. And, verse 30, stretch out your hand to do signs and wonders. Well, actually, that's what really got him into trouble in the first place, because the lame man was healed back, way back. But they want, they want the Lord to say there's no retreat here. And what happened? Well, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all spoke the word boldly. That's the sequel in verse 31. That's the same word, boldly, fearlessly. It's the same word all the way through these passages. Now all of them, notice this, that Peter and John are the ones who went up to the temple to pray and they saw the lame man and they said, silver and gold have I none. But the prayer meeting is all of their people. And this is a prayer for all of their people. And all of their people are praying together for this. And all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of them speak the word plainly. Notice that? That's what we're praying for. So this is not an instruction about what to do, what to do but what to pray. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But um, it's uh, potentially dangerous, isn't it? Right. They're saying, Lord, okay, let's go through this all again now. We're somewhere else. Well, that is what happened. Okay, well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Just pray for clarity, boldness, to speak the word, make it plain. Allow the Lord to enable you to do it, give you the words to do it, stretch out his hands to do signs and wonders and whatever. So let me just summarise all this, because this is a short talk tonight. What are we to do? The example is, explain the mystery of the gospel. Tell the secret that the gospel is going to all the nations. Or to say it in different words, speak the word of the gospel that God has given you. Tell the gospel. How to do it? Well, by speaking. That's the thing that runs through all of this, isn't it? That's pretty simple, isn't it? Talk. You've got to talk. <laughs> There's more to that, of course. You need to do some other stuff as well. But at this level, it at least includes talking. Boldly. Fearlessly, which my, in my understanding is plainly, clearly, so it can't be misunderstood. But that means it has to be translated. You have to translate. If it's going to be spoken plainly, it has to be translated into the terms and language of the person you're talking to, which will always be different, won't it? So the better you understand the person, the more plain you can make the speech. The other side of that, of course, is the better you understand the gospel, the more plain you'll make it. And you, you understand it yourself, don't you? The people who really know a huge amount about something will be the ones who can explain it most clearly. The ones who are just beginning and are muddled will muddle it. 
Well, that's okay. If you're a beginner in Stittle Muddle, that's all right. The Lord has called you to do it too. But what we're asking the Lord to help us to do is to do it um, plainly in the sense that it can't be misunderstood and that it may provoke a, a negative reaction, but the purpose is to provoke a positive reaction. So they are, aha, at last I've heard the great news from God. At last someone has explained it to me. Thank you. I want to believe it. That's what it's for. We need help to do this. So Paul says, pray that words will be given to me. That's worth praying for, isn't it? That I'll be enabled to do it, because the Spirit of God has to be involved in this. That signs and wonders will be done. Well, whatever God wants to do now, we can trust God to do it. It hasn't stopped. Maybe it's not as dramatic as it is in other parts of the world or other times, but the Lord hasn't kind of put some blanket over all of this and says, well, I'm not doing any of that for you at all. At least ask God to do something. And it might be an astounding thing within our culture that we can't even find in the Bible. But the Lord is doing something. Well, it's his business. Filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't ask for that to happen, but that's what happened because they wanted to serve the Lord. They wanted to do what the Lord had told them to do. And the context that we've just been reading about is really in the context of threats, and in Paul's case, prison. Uh, possible death on the part of, well, uh, John got killed pretty soon after, I think, didn't he? Oh, no, not Peter. It was James, that, the other one. James got killed soon after. Now, I want to finish by coming back to this phrase that's used. It's a word back in Acts 4, verse 24. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Now, this is a really interesting Greek word, homothumidon. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> homothumidon. And to translate it as together is really weak and pathetic, in my view. Uh, it's what they did in chapter 1, verse 24. Well, it doesn't need a link. Um, is that the right verse? Sorry, one, chapter 14. Chapter 1, verse 14. That's chapter 1, verse 14. Might as well get the right reference. Mm. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Even that doesn't quite get the picture. Romans 15 is the better place to look. And we've got some really old translations hidden in your bookshelves. They'll probably do better too. Romans 15, verse 6. Or five. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this word has the idea of having the same mind or the same purpose or the same impulse. Uh, the sec it's a compound word. And the second part of the word when it's used alone, it's used for anger, uh, sometimes for desire, for impulse, usually negatively, but sometimes positively. But in this case, the compound word has the idea of strong purpose and desire. And the fact that it's, it has the compound one in it means that the group together, with one heart and voice and mind and spirit, is doing something with passion together. They're not just praying together because they're all together in the same room, mm -hmm. but they've got this, this united desire to call out to God. Now you can see it in Acts 4, can't you? There's this huge threat. Peter and John, you know, they, they've almost lost their lives because that's what happened to Jesus. They're the, same, the same crowd has, has, has warned them off and they got off for some reason because the Lord was in them. They come back. There's terror there. There's fear. What will they do? Together, their hearts are united, their minds are united. Let's call out to God together. There's a passion in it that's implied in this word, I think. You can see it in the same in, in, uh, in, Acts, in Acts 1. Here's this group together. So uh, some of the older translations translated something like, with one heart. And that, that's, that's probably the way to go. And it seems to me that as we pray for each other, as we pray for other people, 
along the lines that we've been looking today, we want to pray for the Lord to send out workers. But if we did it together passionately, that the Lord would send out workers into the harvest. And pray that we'll have a willingness to be sent and we won't prefer under the gum tree. And that we'll pray for the opportunities the Lord gives. And that we'll pray for the words. Lord, give us the words when we get there. Don't let me not worry about it. And for the boldness to do it. And the, and the ability, what is it? Yes, the boldness to say what needs to be said. And not to equivocate and water it down and avoid the issue. And, you know, what we're what we good at. And that the Holy Spirit will enable us. And the Lord will do stuff. That's worth praying for, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm not encouraging you to do any of this. I'm encouraging you to pray that the Lord will do something. Amen. That's easy, isn't it? So you don't have to do anything. Just pray. If you're game, if you're game, if you're game. Are you game? Let's, let's turn that off, Andrew, and we'll pray. Come